Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are really pleased to welcome you to today's yeah, lunch webinar. A really exciting topic, nature-based solutions for building urban resilience. Uh, the event is hosted by the Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute at the University of Melbourne, uh, better known to many of you as MSSI or MISI. Um, and we'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, uh, the Wurundjeri people, the land on which the university is situated, but also all the other traditional owners of the land on which you all are, and pay my respect uh, to the elders past, present and emerging. My name is Sebastian Fastenrath. I'm a postdoctoral researcher with MSSI, focusing on a variety of issues around urban and regional development, uh, sustainability and resilience. Um, as part of my role with the City of Melbourne Chair and Resilient Cities, I've worked closely together with the Resilient Melbourne Delivery Office and, for example, helped to, to shape the living Melbourne strategy, uh, which we will be hearing more about today. Um, I've organized this webinar um, together with my fantastic and very knowledgeable colleague, uh, Judy Bush, who is a lecturer in um, planning at the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. And uh, Judy and I have been working on this topic over the last two years. Uh, we published a couple of papers uh, and um, we came up with the idea to bring the discussion uh, to a wider audience uh, through this webinar and um, specifically invite local experts and practitioners uh, who can report on their work uh, across metropolitan Melbourne. So we're really happy that we have uh, two experts uh, here with us today, Martin Hartigan and Rachel Lopez. Thank you very much that you are with us today and uh, share your amazing knowledge. Um, Martin Hartigan is currently the Living Melbourne Program Manager, hosted by the City of Melbourne and tasked with implementing the Living Melbourne strategy. As Urban Conservation Manager at the Nature Conservancy, Martin led the development of Living Melbourne, the Metropolitan Urban Forest Strategy, and Martin has experience in managing sustainability teams in local and state government uh, and developing and implementing environmental strategies. Uh, previously, he worked in catchment management and environmental policy domains and was inaugural coordinator of the Inner Melbourne Action Plan group of councils responsible for directing multiple projects across various professional disciplines in a really innovative governance environment. And Rachel Lopez, um, she leads a, the Chain of Ponds collaboration hosted by City West Water, um, empowering communities and agencies to work together for improved waterway management has been Rachel's passion for over 15 years, uh, recently leading the award-winning co-design of the refresh of the healthy waterway strategy at Melbourne Water. Rachel is now working with the Mooney Ponds Creek catchment community and 14 partner organizations to transform the Mooney Ponds Creek into an iconic waterway for Melbourne. Collaborative design, complexity, storytelling, and appreciative inquiry are aspects that she hopes to see expanded across Melbourne. I'm really looking forward to both presentations. Um, last but not least, a few housekeeping rules. Um, I can't tell you where your emergency exits are, where you are. But here's the deal for today. After the two presentations, we have 50 minutes uh, for the audience to ask questions. And I kindly ask you uh, to put your questions uh, in the system via the Q&A function uh, in Zoom. And we try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, and now I'd like to hand over to Judy, who gives a brief introduction into the topic of nature-based solutions and cities before then. Martin and Rachel uh, give their really interesting examples from Melbourne. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sebastian. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so today we're here to talk about nature-based solutions for urban resilience. And, and uh, before I go further, I'd also very much like to acknowledge traditional owners, um, the elders past, present and emerging and, and really acknowledge um, their connection with country and their deep knowledge of land and, and culture, uh, which is integral to, to everything that we're talking about today. So nature-based solutions, it's a relatively new term for ecosystem-based approaches. 
um, that are framed to address a range of societal challenges. You know, so those challenges include climate change, food and water scarcity, human health and well-being issues, economic and social development. So nature-based solutions, that includes a whole range of different types of urban green blue space, including parks and gardens, waterways, nature reserves, street trees, the, the network of green blue. Um, and of course, we, we are increasingly aware of the many functions and benefits they provide for both people and biodiversity. So we know they cool our landscapes, we know they treat our air and water, they provide space for recreation, which we have all been realising, particularly those of us in Melbourne during lockdown, haven't we been grateful for our local uh, green blue spaces. Space for connection uh, with each other, but also connection with nature. And of course, they act as habitat for biodiversity. So there's an increasing focus um, in the research community, but also um, amongst practitioners, government and so on, about how nature-based solutions can contribute to those broader challenges. And indeed, some of those global uh, frameworks and, and global discussions around, for example, sustainable development goals, climate change. In the lead up to next, the next meeting for the Convention for Biological Diversity, which is scheduled for next year, we think it's really timely actually to examine some of the local actions that are happening here in Melbourne. Um, and and some of these local actions that are seeking to extend and scale up urban greening efforts. So it's really great to have our two speakers here today because they're both reflecting on some really interesting collaborations that are happening at the metropolitan scale and the sub-metro scale. Um, and so I won't speak any further. I will now hand over to Martin, who is gonna be our, our first uh, case study talking about Living Melbourne. So over to you, Martin. Uh, thanks very much, Judy. Really appreciate the introduction. Um, look, I'll just share screens now that I've got the opportunity. Get ourselves off and running. Look, thank you very much for the opportunity. I do appreciate it. Look, Living Melbourne uh, is the project that I'll talk about today. And it's an, it's an innovative nature-based approach to protecting and enhancing ecosystem services and, and biodiversity in cities. Now, today I'll just touch on a few things, um, the background to the strategy, key aspects of the strategy, the collaboration that enhances this development, the vision goals and actions, and I'll concentrate a little bit on implementation actions uh, happening at the moment. And I'm gonna move through this pretty quickly in the interests of time. So the Nature Conservancy uh, partnered with Resilient Melbourne in 2016 to lead the development of Living Melbourne and provide expert scientific ex guidance. Now, the Nature Excuse Conservancy- Excuse me, Martin, we can't, we can't see your slides. Oh, really? Shared screen, one moment. Okay. Hmm. One moment, try again. Is that better? Perfect. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. So TNC led this work pro bono uh, as part of its global commitment to 100 resilient cities. And it contributed urban conservation science and policy and finance expertise from a range of local and international staff. Now, Living Melbourne is a metropolitan opportunity. Living Melbourne um, covers about 10,000 square kilometres of metropolitan Melbourne across 32 municipalities. And it's a large area. It's an extraordinarily large area by global standards. And it also addressed 
um, both local government authorities and state government organisations such as environment, land, water and planning, health, transport and others, and also academic research organisations. And this is part of the collaboration and also not-for-profit organisations. But the main thing around metropolitan Melbourne is this fragmented governance that you've got state and local government authorities. And this makes it difficult to coordinate and do collective action. And we really recognise that it's only collectively can we meet the challenges and threats to our natural assets. Now, urbanisation is a, is a real challenge for metropolitan Melbourne. Um, we know that Mel metropolitan Melbourne is growing. It's 5 million at the moment. It's expected to grow to 9 million by 2050. Uh, it'll possibly outgrow Sydney. We'll see whether COVID-19 puts a dent in that. But rapid urbanisation causes the loss of permeable surfaces, canopy cover, vegetation and, and various habitats. And the two pictures here are, um, are relevant from across any Australian city. We've got three dwellings on three lots on the left and then urban densification. Well, is this is so it's increased the yield. You've got three lots, but you've got eight dwellings, but you've lost a lot of urban vegetation, permeable surfaces, you've got black roofs, it makes life a little bit hotter and a lot less uh, nature, nature's involved. So I'll go back a step. Just reinforcing this, there was some research undertaken by Joe Hurley and others um, in 2019, based on some um, mapping work done by DELP. And it identified that right through the east of Melbourne, so our leafy eastern suburbs, um, we're losing our vegetation, largely, largely due to urban densification. And interestingly, in the north and the west, so starting from a very low base of vegetation, we are uh, actually gaining a little bit as new suburbs come in, new parks, street trees and backyards are being put in, which is increasing urban vegetation where it was an, an urban canopy where it was previously largely grassland plain. So there's some interesting um, elements happening here. Now, why is Melbourne's urban forest important? Now, look, I won't dwell on this because I think Judy uh, really um, uh, expressed that very, very well about the benefits of the urban forest and urban greening and nature-based solutions. But just to say that Melbourne's urban forest is made up of all the trees and shrubs, grasses, soil, water on public and private land across metropolitan Melbourne, that whole area of metropolitan Melbourne. So we're not just talking about trees and canopy cover, we're talking about the whole elements of the forest. Now, I'm showing here some mapping products. So these are three key science elements or empirical evidence that helped provide for the vision goals and actions in Living Melbourne. On the left hand side there, you can see the urban forest mapping that was undertaken by the Nature Conservancy, and that was in partnership with um, Digital Globe and Trimble and a number of very smart GIS people in Melbourne and in New Zealand. And then that shows very much the urban green of metropolitan Melbourne in the east, and then in the north and the west, uh, less, uh, less canopy coverage. So the darker the green, the more canopy coverage. It doesn't show grasslands because it overwhelms the map. In the middle, there was some biodiversity modelling done where we worked with BirdLife Australia to show some opportunities maybe for connectivity in the, in the landscape. But different bird species have different needs. You can see up there in the top left hand corner, the Eastern Yellow Robin really likes the well-structured vegetation of the Yarra River and of Dandenong, Dandenong Creek. But the eastern rosella down in the bottom right hand corner is very happy in streetscapes and backyards. You can see that that bright yellow and that bright green very much is, a, is across the eastern, eastern suburbs everywhere. And on the right hand map is urban heat across metropolitan Melbourne. So the urban heat uh, is identified from blue through to red. Blue areas is where it's really um, normalised in terms of it's the same as a background baseline. Uh, yellow, orange and red is where it gets uh, hotter and hotter. And you can see there in the north and the west of metropolitan Melbourne, where they're really our hot spots, where it's 10 degrees or above a baseline temperature without um, urban uh, development. And if you flick your eyes between the heat map and the urban greening map, 
you can see that where the canopy is, it's cooler, and where the canopy isn't, it's hotter. And then the, there was a, some very good modelling undertaken where that was also modelled against vulnerable communities. And again, it matches up very well. Where it's hottest, there are more, there are more likelihood of vulnerable people and vulnerable communities. And there's also a lack of vegetation, and particularly a lack of canopy cover. Consultation and co-design was critical to the development of Living Melbourne. So as I said, we worked across 32 councils and we worked across a range of state government organisations, uh, research institutions and not-for-profit organisations. So about 65 organisations were involved in the development of Living Melbourne. There were four key workshops where um, we kept working back to the um, to, to these to, uh, organisations to say, this is what you've said, this is what we've undertaken to date, is this correct and how does this build on what we've done? And this really built the vision and then the goals and the actions of Living Melbourne itself. So I, excuse me, I often say, look, Living Melbourne is not the Nature Conservancy's document. It's not Resilient Melbourne's document. It's our document. It's very much our metropolitan urban forest strategy. Uh, so it was very much shaped by this consultation that was undertaken across a, a range of organisations. And we still have that engagement with those organisations now, which, which shows the bond that it's, that it's, um, it's created. And what do we get from that? So the result of this co-design was an agreed metropolitan vision goals and, uh, and actions. And Living Melbourne's vision there is our thriving communities are resilient and connected through nature. And this is supported by the three goals surrounding it. Uh, it's not um, not in any numbered order because they're integrated. There's a, it, uh, our urban forest protects human health, it nurtures abundant nature, and it strengthens natural infrastructure. Now, these goals in turn are supported by actions. Now, there are six action areas and there are 20 actions within Living Melbourne. Now, I'm not going to read them out, you're capable of having a look at them, but the actions work towards you know, advancing, bringing together and advancing the momentum of existing initiatives that, not, that, that they might be taken to scale. So we're always looking at metropolitan scale and the actions work towards this end, as well as identifying critical gaps that are best addressed collectively. It's the collective action that's important. Now, as a result, we had 41 organisations that we particularly targeted for um, endorsement. Uh, most councils, water authorities, and Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning endorsed on behalf of the state government, as well as Parks Victoria, which was marvellous. Implementation. Now, I'll quickly move you know, through a few implementation actions. Um, there's three that I'll highlight to date. There's about eight implementation actions being undertaken at the moment. Now, the first one is the Greening and Cooling Melbourne action that's being undertaken by Melbourne Water. Now, this is a foundation project that's completed quite recently. And the project sought to understand current and future, so 2020 and 2050 irrigation demands in the face of changing climate by identifying key variables um, like we, uh, in terms of how they're likely to change, as well as the proportion of water that may come from alternative water sources. Now, vegetation, as we know, provides cooling um, for the environment, but we need the water, it's, it's essential. And in many cases, areas that are currently um, green in a hotter and in a, in a drying climate will become dry and less green and less cooling. So urban densification will you know, increase the demand for quality green space and urban growth will increase the total area of green space. Now, I think Melbourne Water really clearly recognised that themselves and the other water authorities didn't have a clear handle on what the demand might be and what the sources might be of water. And they sought to start to work this out a little bit. And they did this by looking at some key questions. So they ask, you know, which urban greening elements might require irrigation? And they, this really talks to backyards, state parks, passive open space, active open space, trees and golf courses. And they ask themselves, you know, how might these elements change into the future? And we know that as Melbourne expands, the amount of open space and number of private gardens will increase. 
but private gardens are getting smaller. And on the other flip side, we're planting more trees and advocating for more high quality green open space as we go forward. So there's some interest, interesting conundrums there. They then asked how much water might these elements require? And they, to do this, they, they developed a spatial irrigation model that considered current climate conditions using weather station data, climate change and soil types. And they sort of they calculated irrigation rates for urban greening in 2020 and 2050. They then multiplied the irrigation rate by the amount of vegetation to calculate the total demand. So we're talking water demand. And the biggest unknown is what percentage of vegetation that will be irrigated into the future. Now, where might the water come from? Now, there are, there are a range of, of, of options there. Potable water, recycled water, storm water, rain water and lot scale wastewater, or you might say grey water. And then finally, what are the range of futures that may occur? Now, they developed a multiple future scenarios with a range of assumptions for climate change and the amount of vegetation, the irrigation level and the alternative water contributions. However, just for the sake of brevity, I'll touch on the low and the high scenarios. Now you can see here on the left, you can see the current water demand for urban greening, which is 62 gigalit gigalitres annually. And then you can see a low future and a high future demand scenario. And you can see that under the high future scenario, we are looking at double our current demand. Now if we look at the open space on its own, so the green, uh, the green um, tiles there, uh, you can see that the demand triples between 7.2 gig and 23 gig. Now there's uncertainty across all of these areas. It's model data, but that's why Melbourne Water used, used um, scenarios. And then where does the water come from? So what you're looking at here is the results on the low, low on the left and high on the right, alternative water scenarios. And the top graphs show the total irrigation demand and the bottom graphs show public realm only. So taking out the private gardens. And as you can see from the potable water demand, um, there is the, you can see that it's, it, it's high in both scenarios but there is certainly a great deal of opportunity for alternative water, rainwater, active stormwater, recycled water to be a higher level than the other, than, the, the, than in the low water demand scenario. And that's encouraging. And so what? Well, this provides a great foundation document or a great foundation study to shine a light on the topic and start to unpack, unpack these important scenarios in a client in a changing environment. So, you know, what scenario are we heading towards? What scenario do we want to head towards? Who gets a say in what should be irrigated or not? And how can we create equitable outcomes across metropolitan Melbourne? The next project I want to touch on, and not so much in that detail, is there are two good projects actually. One that led by Earthwatch with a, a working group of stakeholders that is looking at what uh, community industry and engagement. So the project seeks to research, analyze and understand recent successful engagements with the development industry and with the community that have contributed to improved urban greening outcomes. And the goal is to provide a short list of the most successful programs or engagement activities and to determine whether these programs could be taken to scale. So we're doing some really good things across Metropolitan Melbourne, but we've never ordered to do them. So what are we doing that's really, really good? How do we take them to scale? Now, the next stage beyond the scope of this current project is, is to resource the expansion of the most successful projects. And the last project I wanted to touch on is something that I'm really excited about, is that greener spaces, better places have, um, uh, are leading the development of a project which is piloting an online platform that collates and organises um, a resource hub to underpin Living Melbourne. So we've got a range of information and tools, resources and case studies that already exist, but they're spread across a range of websites and, and places, and it's hard to bring them all together. So what we're hoping to do is do that and use uh, an expert group to um, determine what they might be. Now, this is just a starting point. It's a pilot online platform, and they're basically on something that they already, they've already commenced. But 
in time, I'm hoping this could be something quite special. And there are examples around the world, particularly something uh, that Tree Canada has developed, where we can actually learn from uh, what they've undertaken to date. And I'm very pleased with this project. It's something that came, came through very strongly in the implementation planning pro, uh, process with the stakeholders. And I'm really pleased that we've commenced this project. And I will finish there. I'd just like to reiterate that Living Melbourne strategy, you know, deployed a co-design and collaboratory approach to work towards a shared vision for the urban forest and for urban greening solutions. Uh, and I'd like to pass back to Judy to um, take us forward. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Thanks very much, Marty. Um, fantastic presentation and, and um, great to have that um, succinct snapshot of, of what was uh, years in the making, the, the Living Melbourne strategy. Um, so thank you very much. Just a reminder to all our participants to um, put your questions into the Q&A um, section on the website. And uh, so next I want to pass to Rachel, Rachel Lopez from Chain of Ponds Collaboration. Rachel, do you want to try sharing your screen or do you want me to load your Let's slides? Let's have a crack at it again this time. <laughs> that gives me that option. Uh, hmm. No, not quite the option we, we'd like. So maybe Judy, if you could do it, that'd be great. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. All good? Good to go. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Lopes, and I'm the collaboration lead for this fabulous collaboration, The Chain of Ponds, hosted by City West Water. I've come across to City West Water from Melbourne Water, where I was most recently the engagement lead for the co-design of the Healthy, Wa Healthy Waterways strategy. Before getting started, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people and their deep and continuous connection to the land and waters which we're speaking about today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging and to other Aboriginal Australians that may be joining us today. Thank you, we have so much to learn from you. The Chain of Ponds collaboration takes its name from the original creek which meandered through the twisting trunks of majestic river red, gum, river red gums and where series of deep ponds could be seen. The collaboration in its current form has been underway for three years in the Mooney Ponds Creek catchment and in very simple terms is a way of harnessing the collective energy of all interested parties in the catchment to transform the creek. Thanks Judy. Next slide please. Oh it's up. Sorry I can't quite see the same. Um, so as in most catchments, the Mooney Ponds Creek has a number of government agencies and community groups with an interest and responsibilities to manage the creek. And as in many catchments, those agencies and groups are not always well aligned or co cohesive, despite the best intentions. So when local councils approach Melbourne Water to take the lead in a catchment wide approach to the creek, rather than developing another plan, a pilot began to take a collaborative experimental approach, allowing solutions to evolve over time once the perspectives of many were understood. It aligned with other projects across Melbourne at that time um, that were taking a whole of catchment approach, the Healthy Waterways Strategy, Integrated Water Management Forums, the legislation to protect the Yarra River and the Yarra Strategic Plan. Um, Julie Francis was seconded from the City of Melbourne over to Melbourne Water to do this coordination and the project began. Next slide. What did this pilot process look like? Many gatherings and many conversations. Um, so between 35 to 50 people came together from over 30 organisations to articulate the dilemmas, um, the issues and the aspirations for the creek. There were nine half day workshops held, eight site visits and relationships were formed or were renewed. It was the beginnings of very robust building blocks for this collaboration um, and from it a vision and a strong commitment um, developed and resulted in an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding. The governance group was established and again the terms of reference with really great clear principles and objectives um, were developed. 
And there was agreement to co-fund between the organisations um, a lead or coordinating role. For those who aren't familiar with the Mooney Ponds Creek, its catchment extends from Greenvale in the north through parts of Broad Meadows, Glenroy, Pascoe Vale, Essendon, Mooney Ponds before flowing southward through Flemington, Kensington, North and West Melbourne into the Arrow River, but previously into the West Melbourne Swamp. The catchment is now largely urbanised. The creek has undergone extensive drainage and infrastructure works, including significant realignment. And in total, it runs for 35 kilometres and drains an area of approximately 145 square kilometres. In recent decades, a significant change in attitude towards the creek has taken place, driven largely by the community. There's been a growing awareness of the importance of a more healthy creek to the functioning of the expanding city. While the creek can't be returned to its former natural state, there's a recognition that a new identity for the creek, based upon enhanced livability, biodiversity and function, must be forged. Next slide. Um, just, there's a fabulous, and I'd recommend everyone have a look at it, the Chain of Ponds Plan, developed by Venter Slits from Mooney Valley Council with Melbourne Water and Moreland, which um, presents a fabulous chronology um, of the creek which talks about the creek moving in the, from the, its original form as a living creek into very much an agricultural creek in the mid 1800s to a, basically a sewer creek, a drainage creek, an urbanized creek, a recreation creek, an environmental creek, and now the stage we're at now, where, where are we at now? And that's what this collaboration is a little bit about. Next slide. Back to the collaboration process, in the early stage, Twyford's Consulting was brought on to assist and help people understand the environment they were working within, a complex one. Um, and that might sound pretty straightforward, but there is something to studying complexity. Um, and a complex situation involves multiple actors, competing priorities and different perspectives, a situation that is evolving and changing through time, and interconnectedness between the issues, which means that changing one part of the system will have impacts on the whole system. It's kind of an environment where the best way forward is very unclear, and at every turn you find yourself thinking, I don't know what to do next. And that when dealing with complexity, a different approach is required. So Twyfe has introduced um, the group to the Kinevin model um, by David Snowden, a, Welsh, a Welshman, um, and he talks about complexity as a different way of a totally different system of operating and that it requires a different um, approach and that the best approach is an emergent approach where you pilot things, you probe, you try, you sense, respond, that that is the most effective way when you're dealing with a complex environment. And that's certainly the philosophy and the prim principles behind this Mooney Ponds Creek um, and Chain of Ponds collaboration. In complex situations, Twyford would say, you need to jointly determine what the problem is. You need to understand all the different perspectives on the issue, and then you can jointly determine the solutions and together implement the solutions. Next slide. So Twyford has helped us with this model um, in the early days, um, which was about you know, understanding what the dilemma is. Um, or opportunity, it depends how you look at it. Um, getting commitment to collaborate. I need to make this a little bit bigger for me. Um, Co-defining the dilemma, as I mentioned. So the, this collaboration had 18 organisations committed to collaborate initially. Um, they're when they're after discussing, you know, what complexity looked like and, and kind of developing, understand, developing an understanding of that, they also then turn to what is the dilemma or opportunity where tr they're trying to sort through um, and they identify that as how do we transform the Mooney Ponds Creek into an iconic waterway for Melbourne that provides high social and environmental benefits given the diversity of stakeholder interests. So as I said, those proce the process included the half day workshops, site visits, um, and they worked on co-creating a solution together and compiled a range of ideas and, and solutions for the catchment and then co-delivery. This was a, the initial model that the group worked on to kind of, um, it, it's, it's a co-design model. There's different types, but this was the one the group worked with. It was similar to the one that, that was used for the Healthy Waterway Strategy. The launch 
um, was an exciting event down on the creek and 14 organisations signed a memorandum of understanding committing to the Chain of Ponds collaboration. I think of everyone down there. The partners, sorry, next slide. The partners, um, the four councils, Moreland, Melbourne, Mooney Valley and Hume, the water authorities, Melbourne Water, City West and Yarra Valley, the Victorian Planning Authority, Parks Vic, Friends of Mooney Ponds Creek, the Mooney Valley Bicycle Users Group, Living Colour Studios and Art Studio, Conservation Volunteers, Kensington Association and the Friends of Upper Mooney Ponds Creek plus 17 supporting organisations, and I won't list them all, but in there are oops, the universities, um, uh, DELP, the CMA, Bicycle Network, uh, VicTrack, and others. So those were the partners. Um, there were all the interested stakeholders, so many and varied. Next slide. Um, just these are some of the documents, I guess, that the group has produced. The first one, as I mentioned, the Memorandum of Understanding. The second one on the right was really interesting. It was a prospectus they developed very early on, which explained the collaboration. But importantly on this map here is a, was a wish list um, of all the things, the top things that this collaboration, that this group of 14 key stakeholders and 17 supporters wanted to see happen for the Mooney Ponds Creek catchment. And for me, this was a really a powerful tool when I came across it when I was working on the healthy waterway strategy. A really powerful influencing tool um, and a tool to help um, uh, uh, improve the chances of getting funding, basically. Um, an advocacy and influencing tool, which was really um, successful for the collaboration. The collaboration also has um, working groups within it, so a, a governance group, um, a strengthening planning controls group, eco arts group, um, a group working on guidelines for transport trails and connectivity to, to create a similar look and feel along the creek, a litter catchment wide litter group and a mapping and data group. Next slide. Some of the achievements um, and I'm in my early days in this in this fabulous role so I'm still um, this is all my gatherings of what I've learned so far but I, I still it, I'm already coming down to the fact that um, the social capital and the um, relationships and trust with each other is what is what is the key uh, ingredient um, obviously the other of the achievements are these improved social environmental outcomes on the ground coordinated revegetation, land acquisition, pedestrian bridges going in, um, improved access to the creek generally, and some naturalisation proposals. I'll tell you a bit more about that later. Um, there's active working groups, as I said, um, and there's project specific groups. Um, the other achievements, are, as I said, gaining funding from DELP, so um, 400,000 um, for one project, uh, a bridge project, integrated more, Water Management Forum was more funding to do a feasibility for a naturalisation, 75,000. And the very exciting one, um, the Naturalising Mooney Ponds Creek, 5 million. Um, there's some quotes there for some of the collaborators in the group. And um, the group won uh, last year's Stormwater Victoria Award for Excellence in Strategic and Master Planning. So the collaborative group, and that's a picture of them all there. Kay Oddy in the middle from Friends of Mooney Ponds Creek. And these are many of the champions of the collaboration in that picture. Next slide. Um, this is just, um, uh, yeah, for your interest in that the, this was a, how the collaboration has is evolving. It was very much in the pilot establishment phase, um, leveraging investment for on-ground projects, project planning and communication. Then it moved to um, collaboration that would address catchment wide issues. So these little working groups that looks across the whole catchment about how we can sort, you know, flooding that's happening in the bottom, but it's being caused by, you know, development in the top and various things like this, starting to look at that. And where we are now, I guess, is just, um, reflecting and kind of sussing out what what does a mature collaboration look like just going to finish up by briefly sharing two of the exciting projects on the ground um, the first is as i mentioned the naturalization of a section of the mooney ponds creek last year the exciting news came through that delp was supporting the collaboration by providing a five million dollar grant to deliver one of the projects on the group's wish list 
prospectus, as I mentioned. The project aims to remove 500 metres of concrete channel along the Mooney Ponds Creek in Oak Park and Strathmore. As part of the vision to revitalise the creek, this project was important symbolically, is important. This is, was the final section of the creek to be concreted in the 1970s, uh, and this project aims to return it, this section of creek, to a more natural state. Um, the secondary geotech works start in mid-December and it's getting underway. The second one um, is a, a new pedestrian bridge and cyclist bridge that's being built between Donald Avenue in Essendon and Hopeton Avenue in Brunswick West. This will improve the network of paths in the local area and create a new circuit walking track option for people. The project will also enhance habitat and amenity values and funding for the project was via the Boosting Recreational Use of Waterways Initiative uh, from DELP. Um, and that's underway. The planning phase is definitely underway. The second community consultation happened last night and was well received. Um, and we're looking at some artwork to connect the bridge with the local landscape and origins. Um, as, I, as the exciting thing about this collaboration is that things are evolving quickly and constantly and, and um, there was a last minute opportunity to potentially think about some, um, some artwork for the bridge. So that's um, an exciting development. I'm zooming through here and I'm basically there. In summary, um, it's a delight to be part of this collaboration and support exciting conversations, ideas and projects that are improving this highly impacted but dearly loved river system. That is it for me. If you'd like to be involved, please get in touch. Um, and there's further information. As I said, the Chain of Ponds plan um, is a really well worth a read for this, for this creek. It's got a fabulous um, story of the creek and the history particularly, and information on the collaboration itself. The information is on there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rachel. That's fantastic. Thank you to both Rachel and Martin. Um, so yeah, keep your questions coming to the Q&A. I wanted to kick off um, by asking the first question, prerog prerogative as, as one of the facilitators. Um, so I think collaboration and scale is a, a key themes that you both reflected on, I think, in, in your presentation. Um, and collaboration is interesting in the context of nature-based solutions. They're inherently multifunctional and that can mean that there are tensions um, between delivery of some of those different functions and, and um, tensions between people's um, visions for what should and might be possible to be achieved. So maybe first up, Rachel and, and then Martin, if you can reflect on how you deal with those tensions of competing views, com competing visions, competing objectives for, for um, your, your projects? Sure, I have a, a very relevant example jumping into my head uh, straight away. Um, and that's just recently in COVID times where we've had you know, so many people out and about um, and some young kids and parents, I'm sure, um, building some bike tracks and you know, mountain bike jumps and various things along that our precious waterways and unfortunately doing quite a lot of damage in the process and um, you know damage to um, that work that friends groups have spent many years looking after um, uh, and working on and and this is you know this was a very recent example but it's you know there's so there's the community involved there's a friends group involved there's the council involved and what role do they play and how do they step in and and it, you know this is just one example of many um, of where, you know, there everyone needs to give a little um, often, um, but it's the importance of the relationships um, that you have um, and the trust, um, and that, that that's a unique example, but, you know, across the catchment, it's, you know, it's the competing demands of development um, versus the green with the friends groups and what, what they're trying to achieve. So, um, that's often the, the demands that we're looking at, but the, I believe the relationships is what's important and the conversations and trust you build up 
you know, through going through this process is help, helps you both compromise and work towards a solution together. Um, I, I couldn't agree more actually with you, Rachel. Um, it's a terrific answer. I think the benefits, and I'll actually throw back to Greening the West at this point in time. So I was one of the inaugural members of Greening the West before I even got involved in Living Melbourne. And they started to, they commenced a strategy for Greening the West. And we had really, over a couple of years, we had built this trust and built this community of practice. And there was a great deal of trust with each other to have a robust conversation sometimes. And this is what happened with Living Melbourne also, is that there were quite robust conversations, but we trusted that we all had the same vision. And that made a big difference, that we were there for the right purposes and that we were there to support each other. And in the end, um, those uh, differences of uh, drivers uh, were overcome because we either found room for everybody or we agreed on a compromise way forward together. Um, through that conversation, it's about keeping those channels open and being willing to, I suppose, negotiate and work with each other in an honest and open, a very transparent manner. And that, that's uh, what really counted for us. Great. Um, I'm looking through the questions. Uh, a question from Gerard Healy about measuring success. Um, first of all, well, for both of you, with the Chain of Ponds plan and also with the Living Melbourne plan, how will you measure success and how do different partners um, view success? Yes, really good question. And that's part of uh, my role, I think, in this and this mature collaboration phase that we're in. We really, I don't think there's been much thought about it yet because it's been, you know, a couple of years underway. But part of my role is to think about how we're going to measure that. Um, and it's, I guess, you know, other than ticking off all those things on our wish list, um, that would be one way to do it. Um, for me, it's um, the the success again is the social capital and relationships um, and how you measure that. And I'm still, I'm still trying to find a way and that's, you know, perhaps a relationship with the universities to try and articulate what the social, the power and the strength of social capital and how you measure that and how you can measure that year upon year. Because for me, that is the most important element to a successful collaboration. Um, but how do you articulate and measure that um, is the challenge. Uh, yes, yeah, so we can measure projects on the ground, um, certainly, but um, measuring things that are a little less tangible are going to be tricky. Mm. Yeah, I, I'd Questions also... Then send them out, send them my way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's one of the projects that I've got on my list too, is, is what are the indicators of success? How do you track progress? Um, to some extent, you're, I would say you're right in terms of it's tracking things on the ground that have happened. I mean, Living Melbourne is more of an enabling strategy it's a, um, than a on-the-ground strategy. Um, but there is elements of the targets that were proposed in Living Melbourne. Now, there were targets proposed for further commentary, but they seem to be taken up very rapidly by, by the stakeholders in terms of canopy and shrub cover targets. And in the end, we're in a position where, in order to have an urban forest by 2050, we need to put the time and effort in in the next 15 years. We need to be planting possibly 8 million trees in the next 15 years across metropolitan Melbourne. That's measurable. That's very measurable. Let's get a canopy in place. And how do we do that across public and private land? Because one of the things which is really obvious in living Melbourne is that the private realm of metropolitan Melbourne is about 60 or 65% of the land. So if we're not acting in that space, we're not winning. We can do the, the easy stuff, and I'll say easy with my tongue and my cheek, is public land because we have more control of it. But the, we need to do better. So there are some real measurables for certain projects. We can do project measurables. Are we undertaking the actions within Living Melbourne? Are we undertaking, are we holding true to what we as a collective group decided was the way forward? What do we need to address? And then can we meet the targets as well? So there are some quite solid uh, measurables, I think. Yeah, and, and I think the, um, uh, as you both say, some of the challenges are, are working out how to be able to monitor the 
the less tangible social um, qualitative data um, that, yeah, uh, is seen to be more difficult to, to collect and, and even knowing what to collect and how to collect that data. Um, another question, um, amazing to hear about the scope, ambition and planning and commitment at the Chain of Ponds collaboration. Um, can you elaborate on the role of strategic whole of catchment stormwater management in delivering the long-term vision? There's a bit more there about linking with um, EPA um, provisions as well. Maybe there's a couple of aspects here that perhaps both of you could reflect on, and that is linking with those sort of broader strategic um, plans that are in place, but also do you see a role for your groups in advocating to um, uh, government about uh, stronger planning provisions, for example? Um, yes. It's always confusing asking two questions in one. Sorry. That's fine. Thanks, Thanks, Jung. Jung. I know, Jung. Hello. <laughs> Great question. Um, yes. Um, well, I was surprised the other day to get a... Um, an inquiry from a friends of member who was um, making a, um, had sent an, e an email to the minister um, and the minister had referred them back to the Chain of Ponds collaboration. So it was very cool in that instance um, to help with uh, an inquiry. But um, from, I'm thinking of Lita Young in particular. So we're starting on and uh, Melbourne Waters helping with um, a catchment wide approach to litter management. And litter is at all obviously another very complex uh, topic and how to solve the litter issue is, is um, something that Victoria certainly hasn't managed. And I don't know whether Australia, anywhere in Australia has managed it. Um, you know, there is there's spent enormous money being spent on collecting litter, you know, less, so much less money being spent on um, behaviour change programs around litter. So this is one we will be looking at um, avenues of influencing. Polystyrene is the 55% of the problem in, um, in the Mooney Ponds Creek. So what we'll be lo looking at ways we can influence um, uh, polystyrene existing in the first place, um, or you know, what we can do to, to influence at a broader scale. We have data now. So you know, how this group uses its um, yeah, collaborative muscle, which is a cool new term I've learned. Um, a collaborative muscle to um, try and influence policies will be, that'll be interesting to see, but watch this space. Yeah. Um, I'll answer this, well, I'll probably answer the second part of the question, Judy, in terms of uh, advocating for change um, in planning frameworks. Now, now, planning is partially useful, as we all know. Um, Planning sometimes sets some standards, but it also only applies to those things where um, a permit is required to some extent. So it captures part of the question, but it's an important part of the question. Um, certainly there are projects within the, what I would call the Living Melbourne umbrella that do look for advocacy to state government. We know that DELP are undertaking some work in this area already under Plan Melbourne, which is really important under the cooling and greening I think it's Action 91 of Plan Melbourne. So they're already working within that, within that space. There is also projects to say the City of Melbourne in leading with their Green Factor tool, which is increasing uh, greening for the built environment. And they're working very closely with the CASB group of councils. So councils, Council Alliance for the Sustainable Built Environment. I think I've got that right. Uh, which are or have been advocating for years on this in this space and, and creating change in individual council um, uh, planning schemes, and then there is advocacy with the Victorian uh, the Victorian Planning Authority in terms of um, precincts sustainable precinct plans, uh, which is being reviewed at the moment, and so there is a range of areas where you know Living Melbourne stakeholders can influence planning. There was also a, there's also a group under Living Melbourne that were looking at the bushfire provisions under the, v, under the VPPs and advocating for change there. And then uh, DELP undertook the change uh, anyway, which was a, a good thing and a benefit. Um, so there, look, absolutely, there are, there are um, opportunities for advocacy and working with the state government and with individual councils and groups of councils uh, to make change to planning 
um, as well as uh, non-planning elements. Maybe in our last two minutes, you can both have the challenge of quickly responding to a really great question from Christine Kilmartin that follows really closely, I think, from this discussion about planning. The flip side, how can we make sure that we continue to have spaces that provide um, children with opportunities for adventure and, and um, discovery, you know, for spaces that might be perceived within a risk management framework to be unsafe or untidy? Sure, very quickly, um, I'll jump in on that one. We, this is related to the, you know, our, uh, the safety concern about um, the council actually came in and had to close a few of those jumps around natural, uh, the, the mountain biking little jumps they made. Um, but council has since, you know, just pivoted and will be, and their, their officers are actually now can, talking about, with the young kids, about where else could they have this space. So providing a new space that does have, you know, for mountain biking kind of have jumps and all fun stuff. So they've been um, brilliant, that Smallland and Mooney Valley in, in kind of um, flipping that conversation and, and, and um, trying to make the best for the kids. Yeah, and I think um, nature play is fantastic for kids and the more untidy nature play areas, the better. Climb a, climb a tree, get dirty. Um, and I think councils very much in terms of the new play spaces they're creating um, are much more naturalised and provide that opportunity that they didn't have before. So look, um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan and um, I think uh, it's risk, risk management to a point um, that kids have got to have fun. They've got to be kids. Mm. It does highlight though, doesn't it, those, um, those real tensions in those competing narratives or understandings of, of you know, how we um, plan and manage our, our public open spaces. Um, you know, and the, yeah, I think nature-based solutions and green spaces are very much the arena of those, those tensions for, for differing understandings. Um, I'm conscious of the time so I feel like we've actually, even though we have some other questions that I haven't got to, I feel like we should probably um, wind up now. Um, certainly I think it's been really great to hear from you both and I think um, it's, it would be really great to continue a, a focus on, on nature-based solution, solutions through um, Missy um, seminars and so on. Um, so um, I'd like to thank you both very much for um, speaking to us today um, and prompting some interesting discussions and, and thoughts on, on scaling up nature-based solutions and how collaboration can support that process. Um, and I'd also like to thank Sebastian and Missy for um, hosting today's seminar. Sebastian, I'll leave you to make the, the final comments. Oh, thank you very much, Julia. Thanks to you for moderating this really, really interesting discussion. And yeah, thanks also from my side to Rachel and Martin. Uh, I think that was a really good discussion. And as Judy said, hopefully just a starting point for probably a series of, of discussions that could follow up over the next couple of years. I think there's a lot to do in Melbourne and also other cities. Um, yeah, thanks again. And yeah, we probably made it 1 p.m. So yeah, yeah. thanks everyone, the audience as well. Uh, if there are more questions, please get in touch uh, with Judy or myself. Uh, look our email address up on our website and we try to get in touch with you. Yeah, thank you very much to all audience, Martin, Rachel, Judy. Thanks. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. Bye-bye. Ciao. -bye.